uh, critical issues in energy. Tonight's topic is the future of plastics, design, sustainability, recycling, or something else. And we've got a great panel here. Um, I'm Ramanan Krishnamurthy, Chief Energy Officer at the, here at the University of Houston. Um, as I mentioned, we have a fantastic panel and a, uh, an outstanding moderator, and I'd like to thank uh, them for being here, as well as all of you for braving this weather and uh, making it to uh, this session here. Uh, one of, uh, I want to especially thank our media partner, Houston Public Media, uh, who's helped spread the word uh, and get, uh, get people on here to this site as well as uh, online. Uh, this uh, event is a creation of our uh, President's uh, Energy Advisory Board, uh, and they give us strategic guidance on, uh, on programming as well as the kinds of symposia we should be looking at. Um, many of our energy fellows have been instrumental in making uh, the uh, University of Houston a thought leader in the energy space, and I want to thank them for being a part of the community here. Uh, finally, and perhaps most importantly, I'd like to thank two groups of people who really make this event happen. One is the Energy Coalition. This is a huge student organization that, uh, th that comes from nine different colleges and really represents the best of our students in energy. They, along uh, with, the, with my staff and colleagues at UH Energy, make this symposia possible, and I want to really extend a special thanks to them. And one person who stands out amongst them uh, is Lauren Kibler, who has really uh, done most of the uh, yeoman's work in getting this uh, symposium together. So a few quick notes about tonight's event. Uh, for those of you who've been here before, none of this will be surprising. Uh, for those of you if you have not been here, you could certainly share with your friends and family that this event is being uh, uh, shared on Facebook Live. They can watch this happen. Um, and, uh, and then uh, in a week's time, this event will show up on YouTube, uh, and you can certainly share the, uh, the, uh, share the events with, with your friends. Uh, one thing about your phones, certainly silence them, but you, I, I'd, I'd encourage you to use the, your phone to ask your questions. Your questions will be done electronically. Uh, you'll submit them via that online link. Uh, you don't have to memorize it. It'll show up periodically uh, throughout the session today, uh, and please do share your questions uh, for the audience. So without further delay, let me introduce our moderator, uh, Dr. Megan Robertson. Megan is an associate professor of chemical and biomolecular engineering here at U of H, and a, a good friend of mine, and I'm glad that she is here and is moderating the panel. She is the Associate Director for the, of the International Polymers and Soft Matter Consortium. And uh, she's, uh, she's been here about nine years at the, at the university. Her research focuses on polymeric materials, as you would expect, um, and really trying to get uh, physical properties and function that are unparalleled using sustainable uh, feedstock and sustainable polymers. Uh, these include uh, plastics derived from renewable resources, longer lasting plastics, and perhaps most importantly, understanding end of life options for polymers. Uh, without further ado, uh, Megan. <clears throat> All right, thank you, Ramanan, for the kind introduction, and it's really a pleasure to be here today um, and participate in this symposium. Uh, what I want to do first is give you a little bit of an overview of the scale of the problem when we think about sustainability issues surrounding plastics. And I want to start this conversation with the idea that, um, you know, plastics are amazing materials. They're everywhere in our lives, and it's really hard to imagine a world without them. Um, so that's likely not going to change soon due to their diverse properties and functions and ability to be used in a wide variety of applications. Um, given their prominent role in our lives, we have to think about, you know, how do we address the impact that they have on the environment? And that's essentially what this symposium is all about. Now, I'll point out that 384 million tons of plastic are produced every year worldwide. Um, and so this is a huge industry. A lot of materials are being produced every day, and we really need to think about their fate and what impact they have. If we think about the sustainability implications of plastics, we really have to look at the full life cycle. First, where do plastics come from? Primarily, they're derived from petroleum resources. What implications does that have in terms of utilization of a finite resource? 
um, emissions related to petroleum processing. And also, um, we can think about issues uh, related to the production of plastics. Um, not only what type of monomer is used or what type of resource, is it a bioresource versus a petroleum resource, but also uh, what type of transportation costs are there? Uh, what are the chemicals and energy requirements of actually producing the plastics from those resources? Those are all um, important questions surrounding the sustainability. Then if we think about the lifetime of plastics, how long are they actually used in applications? Um, you know, can they be used for, do we have issues such as single-use plastics versus reusable products. Um, you know, how should society address those as we think about the impact of uh, plastics on the environment? And finally, their end-of-life fate. Can they be recycled? Can they be composted? Where should we be putting our en energy in terms of those types of processes versus incineration versus land filling? filling? And where do all the plastics end up um, after their useful lifetime in products? If we look a little bit about at the current state of affairs, this is just a snapshot of the United States. And you can see in the United States, the dominant uh, mode of dealing with plastic waste is in, uh, in landfilling, which is about 75%. Uh, then that's followed by incineration. Uh, our re rate of recycling is actually one of the lower um, throughout the world, and only 9%. Um, and then mismanaged, meaning it ends up somewhere it shouldn't, uh, is, is pretty low, less than 1%. Um, now let's look at the global picture. If we look at, this is, oh, there we go. So if we look at, for example, Europe, um, the picture really changes. Uh, much higher rate of recycling. Uh, incineration is preferred over landfilling due to available land mass. If we look in Asia, again, we see higher rate of recycling in China. Um, you know, again, landfilling is not as prominent there. Um, incineration is, is more preferred. Um, there is a higher rate of mismanaged plastics um, in Southeast Asia, we see, and we see some implications of that in, in the aquatic environment. And finally, the global picture, um, again, we're seeing uh, landfilling is less preferred, more focus on recycling than in the United States, and a higher emphasis on incineration with more of the plastics going in unintentional places. On the subject of plastic waste ending up in unintentional places, um, certainly a, 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 a point that has caught society's interest at the moment is the plastics in the ocean. So it's, a, it's an interesting point uh, to note that about 3% of the produced plastics um, have currently are going into the ocean. Um, so 3% doesn't sound like a large number, but out of 384 million tons, um, that's still a lot of plastic. Um, there's issues surrounding microplastics, meaning the size of the plastic pieces is less than five millimeters. Um, those are much more difficult to collect, can have uh, different implications than larger plastics like water bottles. And uh, so now if we think about, you know, why is it that we don't recycle, say, 100% of plastics? Um, and I think our panel will be talking on some of these issues as we go along. Um, but in terms of conventional recycling, which is primarily through heating the materials, first sorting, then heating, and finally reprocessing them into something new uh, after melting and, and, and cooling them to a, to a product, um, there, there are a lot of problems uh, that prevent us from reaching really high rates of recycling. For example, the sorting process is expensive, um, and, and all of the plastics are coming in mixtures, and they're not compatible with one another, so they, they have to be separated out. Um, a lot of products are made from more than one type of plastic. It, it actually can't be sorted and it can't be recycled directly. Uh, when we recycle the plastic, plastics through a conventional process, we actually make a worse product. It's downgraded. It's downcycled instead of upcycled. And so this limits the value of that recycled uh, material for the, its next uh, application in a product. Um, and finally, there, this is really focusing on plastics, but if you think about polymers in general, things like rubbers or um, thermosets that are used in uh, things such as you know, automotive industry or aerospace industry, they can't even be recycled through those conventional means. So are there other alternatives we should think about for, for increasing our rate of recycling or reuse? Um, another issue I wanted to point out is that of uh, the source of the polymers. So like I said, most are coming from petroleum. If we look worldwide, less than 1% of plastics are bioplastics coming from biorenewable feedstocks, plant-based or other feedstocks that can be regenerated. Um, you can see um, in other areas of the world, there's actually a greater emphasis on this than in the United States. The numbers across the map of the world are percentage of the world bioplastics coming from each region. 
Um, so much greater percentage in, say, Asia, for, or um, even higher percentage in Europe versus the US. And, you know, what resources could we use to create plastics? We could think about things such as plant sugars, vegetable oils, um, other plant products like natural rubber, which comes from the rubber tree, lignocellulose from biomass. Um, and certainly there are a lot of, um, you know, there are a lot of products out there that have some component of these biorenewable plastics, but it's only making up about 1% of the, to less than 1% of the total production. And why is that? Um, why can't we just switch everything over to the plastic from a renewable resource? Well, first, there can be property limitations. Uh, there, you know, we can't make the exact same material with the right function for the application that from a, a bioresource than we can from a petroleum resource. Um, even if we can do that, the processing might be different, the fabrication, the production process. And so it's not just a drop in replacement from an industrial perspective. It requires new equipment, infrastructure changes. Um, even if we can do all of that, we have to think about cost. Is it more costly? If so, will consumers pay that premium for the green product? And that's not always the case. Um, I did want to mention, since this is an area of, of my own uh, passion in my research group, uh, we, we spend a lot of time on, on these issues surrounding polymer sustainability. And so we are working on a lot on the resource side in terms of using vegetable oils, um, plant resources for making lots of different classes, not just plastics, but also thermosets, elastomers, um, like rubber materials. And, and we look at a lot of different ways to make materials with the right properties um, that they can function in a competitive way to their petroleum analogs. Um, we're also looking at the end of life in terms of looking at degradation as a route for dealing with a waste material that cannot be recycled using conventional means. Um, and also looking at extending the lifetime of polymers so less waste is created in the, in the, in the, in, in the beginning. Um, and so I just wanted to leave one final point before I move on to the panel, and that's that this is really a global issue. I show the numbers globally for plastic production, how the world is dealing with this in different ways in different regions, and so we, we can't work on this in isolation, and so we have to come together across the world, come up with solutions. They probably have to be tailored for individual communities, but um, we simply cannot solve this uh, problem in isolation. And it will require collaboration among different entities. So on our panel, we have a really nice uh, diverse representation from uh, industry, from government, from universities. And we really need the general public to participate as well. Um, we can come up with all kinds of technological solutions, um, but we need society to be on board with uh, things such as recycling or, um, you know, limiting uh, uh, the waste of, of plastic materials in order for that to actually have an impact. Okay, so hopefully that, um, that helped uh, leave some, open up some questions in your mind or uh, introduce the topic. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to hear from all of our panelists um, who are going to give us their perspective on some of these topics that I mentioned and, and others as well. Um, and through each speaker, you're welcome to submit your questions for the Q&A. And after each speaker has a chance to talk briefly, uh, then we'll, we'll start going through the Q&A questions at that point. So what I want to do next is I wanted to introduce our four speakers, before, and then they'll come up one at a time. Um, so on the very, I'll start on the very left. Uh, we have Dr. Nicole Fitzgerald. Um, she is from the Department of Energy, and she is a technology manager in the Bioenergy Technologies Office. Um, she manages R&D projects related to designing bio-based plastics and also bio-based recycling. Uh, next to her right, we have Dr. Jill Martin um, from Dow Chemical Company. Uh, Dr. Martin is a Global Sustainability Fellow at Dow Chemical, and for the past 25 years, she has served in both R&D as well as technical service and deployment in the performance plastics field. Next to Dr. Martin, we have Dr. Susanna Scott. Uh, Dr. Scott designs catalysts for efficient chemical manufacturing, including polymerization, and for environmental protection, including emissions after treatment and polymer upcycling. She is a distinguished professor um, in, at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And finally, on, our, on the very right, we have Dr. Ganesh uh, Nagarajan. D uh, Dr. Nagarajan has spent 25 years in the polymer industry uh, and is currently an associate director for polymers business development and projects at Lion Delta Cell Industries. And so with that, uh, we'll start with, with Dr. Fitzgerald. Okay, so hello. Um, thank you.
thank you so much for having me, and thank you to Dr. Christian Murthy for putting this event together. Um, I've learned a lot about UH Energy today, and it's very impressive, and I sincerely hope that um, some of the students here consider an alternative career with the federal government. So why are we talking about the future of plastics? Well, plastics are having a bit of a crisis right now. On the one hand, we love plastics and the convenience that they bring to our lives and the energy and resource savings that they offer. Um, plastic, we use plastics to lightweight vehicles uh, to conserve fuel. We use plastics to package our food uh, to ensure that they don't spoil and that they're easier to transport. Um, but at the same time, we're burying ourselves in plastic waste. So we've all seen disturbing images of wildlife being mutilated by uh, discarded plastic. Uh, we've heard statistics, um, such as Megan just said, that we only recycle about 10% of our plastics. Um, coming from the Department of Energy, we know that we use quite a bit of our oil to make plastic, 6% of the world's oil. That's on par with the size of the global aviation sector. Um, and plastic use is protected to grow. And why not? It's a fantastic material, um, or it, they make up fantastic materials that we use every day. Um, but at that rate, and with current rates of leakage into the environment, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation projects that by 2050, there will be as much plastic in the ocean as fish by weight. So pretty bad. Um, so what's going on? Why do we lose so much plastic to the environment? Why do we re recycle so little? I think one thing that many people would point to is that it just does not make economic sense to recycle. Um, much of our, the vast majority of our recycling infrastructure is based on mechanical recycling, uh, which is another word for downcycling. So getting to a material that is worth, le worth, worth less than what you started with. So with mechanical recycling, you're taking a relatively pristine, clear plastic stream, uh, washing, grinding, uh, melting, forming pellets, and then making something that is less valuable, uh, maybe insulation, maybe carpet fibers. But every time you go through this process, you're losing um, polymer integrity, um, you're degrading your polymer, and you, instead of uh, recycling in a cycle, uh, you're actually uh, going straight uh, in a linear fashion to landfill, so not a closed loop recycling as we like to think about it. So at my office at the Department of Energy, I work in the Bioenergy Technologies Office, we fund technology um, development to address uh, major challenges to the energy sector. So we don't um, come up with or enforce policy to incentivize certain behaviors. We try to address energy sector challenges um, with uh, technical, technological innovations that can make an impact. So the strategy that we've taken with um, the plastics problem is to recognize, um, and this is a strategy I think that many people have taken, is to recognize that uh, mechanical recycling or downcycling does not make economic sense, and we need technological solutions that allow us to recycle into materials that have the same or improved value. Um, so, and then when there's some sort of economic value associated with recycling, um, then society is gonna be less likely to lose that valuable feedstock um, into the environment. So within our office, we've been funding three new areas of research and development um, to kind of address this problem. So the first thing that we wanna do is develop new strategies for deconstructing existing plastics. Um, so moving more towards chemical recycling. So the idea here is that instead of mechanically um, treating the, the plastics waste, how can you um, decompose the, deconstruct the plastic waste into its component monomers or maybe some other uh, component that you can then reform into a um, product of the same value, so closed loop recycling. Um, we're particularly interested in novel biological and chemical strategies that obviate the need for complex separations and um, contamination removal. Um, enzymatic processes are particularly well suited for that, so um, because they can depolymerize in the, process, in the presence of a lot of contaminants. So you've seen some initial successes with this. If you've heard of like PETase or um, enzymes that degrade PET, um, that recently came out of the National Renewable Energy Lab um, with uh, University of Portsmouth. So that's one strategy that we're really interested in as a possible solution. Another strategy that we've been funding research for is for new technologies for upcycling. So this is. To, the idea here is that you'd be making something worth more than the original plastic that you started with. Um, so you, 
in this situation, you've done some sort of chemical recycling to break down your polymer, and then with this useful chemical stream, you're making something new um, that you wouldn't have made before. So an example of a potential upcycled pro um, material is like carbon fiber reinforced plastic. So this material makes up 50% of the airframe of the Boeing Dream Dreamliner. Um, it's essential for light weighting and for fuel efficiency. And so we have lots of researchers that are looking at how you can introduce renewable and recycled um, plastic into making materials like this. Um, upcycling technologies are important because they provide economic value um, and further encourage the development of chemical recycling infrastructure. Um, and also upcycling can be uh, very energy efficient. So within our office, we have standards of at least 50% um, supply chain energy savings um, relative to making the same uh, product from a uh, virgin material. And finally, the third area that we are funding research is in de design new plastics for infinite recyclability. So how can you make plastics for tomorrow that have um, been designed with their end of life in mind? Um, we are particularly interested in bio-based feedstocks uh, to answer that problem, uh, and that's because bio-based feedstocks contain a lot of carbon-oxygen bonds, uh, which can be further functionalized um, and, and modified to kind of introduce zippers or other types of um, functionality for your plastic. So kind of a way to think about this, it's not very technical, um, but is to think about Legos. Um, so on, on a Lego, you have a little, the little studs, my husband calls them nubbins, um, and those are what are used to connect the Legos together. And the more kind of studs that you have on that Lego, the easier it is for you to um, make something new. So you can imagine that is making your polymer. So when you start with a hydrocarbon or petroleum feedstock, you're starting with a Lego that essentially has no studs. And so you have to use chemistry to introduce oxygen or other functionality to give you that handle that you need to polymerize. And then um, when you do that, kind of the, the paradigm is, is it takes energy, resources, chemicals to do that, so you don't add extra functionality beyond what you need. So you just, um, that would just be wasteful. Um, so that's kind of the paradigm that we're in right now. So when you think about a bio-based feedstock, um, you're thinking about a starting material that is overloaded with studs, something that is, to a chemist, might be overwhelming, and you know, your first instinct is maybe we should remove as much of that as possible because that does not look like anything I've ever dealt with before. Um, but then it starts to get you thinking, well, actually, what could we be making different now that we have all of this functionality already in our feedstock, and how does that change kind of the paradigm of how we've been making products? And have there been products in the past that have been looked at um, that people abandoned because it was too expensive and costly and inefficient to add so much functionality. So it might have been good, but it was never cost effective. So the idea here is, can we start thinking differently about what are the new properties and new, new materials that we could be making, particularly for plastics um, that are highly recyclable? So in conclusion, um, just to summarize, we're, we're looking at new technology solutions for chemical and biological recycling. Um, so to, do, to get to a chemical recycling situation. Um, new strategies for upcycling and new bio-based plastics designed for infinite recyclability. Um, I just wanna highlight, and I think this will become apparent, that this is only a very small piece of the waste plastic um, pie. There's a lot of different um, technologies and societal strategies that need to be um, looked at. So that's it, thank you. I'm going to talk with you um, from a little bit different perspective. Um, I've been with Dow for 25 years, as Megan mentioned in the introduction. <clears throat> I've always been in the plastics world. I actually started in the plastics world when I was 17. Um, I started a recycling program in the small city that I lived in. So dealt with scale, dealt with politics, um, <laughs> dealt with trying to change the consumer behavior. Um, and since that time, I have found that the challenges haven't changed at all. Uh, so it's always back to the future. And for those of you that have watched uh, three of those movies, you know what I'm talking about. So I want to talk a little bit about Dow's perspective um, in this respect. And if you've ever paid uh, much attention to what CEOs of large chemical companies say, 
Um, what Fitterling or Jim Fitterling says, our CEO, is that he wants DAO to be the most uh, inclusive, customer-centric, and sustainable material science company in the world. Uh, so I'm going to talk primarily about how you use material science to grow your sustainability footprint. And there's a number of different ways you can think about that. As a large material science company, most of what we're doing is around uh, areas like polyethylene, um, as well as polyurethanes, as well as silicones. Uh, most of what I'm going to talk about today as far as addressing what we're doing and where we're going is in the area of polyethylene, simply because when people think about plastics and they think about straws and they think about bags and they think about single use, polyethylene and polypropylene are the most common materials used today. But there's really, I think, three different things that we need to think about when we're addressing creating a circular economy in which plastics is a part of that economy. And it really comes back to collection, which is making it something that is easy no matter whether you live in Singapore or whether you live in Mumbai or you live in Houston, Texas. Collection is absolutely critical to making sure the materials get where they need to go, whether it's upcycled or whether they're mechanically recycled or you figure out a way to break it down from a chemical perspective, as Dr. Fitzgerald described. There's also one thing that we don't talk a lot about, which is demand. The reason why recycling rates are so low is because, in essence, we haven't figured out a way as consumers to be comfortable with the fact that materials contain a recycled content. We don't know how to really differentiate that material or that product from the materials that are basically what we've always dealt with for the past 40 years. The other part of it, too, and this is again, what the panel is here to talk about is, what is the technology that we need to do to actually create that circular economy going forward? In order to do that, it is, as Dr. Robinson said, not just one company, not just one technology, but it's, again, an entire box of technologies and solutions that will lead us forward here. So I'll talk a little bit about where we are in that respect. And if you are familiar at all, since most of you may, might be in, of course, the Houston area now, if you go 46 miles or about 50 miles, depending upon where you live in Houston, directly south, you'll run into our plant. Um, please don't run into the plant, however. I don't recommend that. Um, but you're welcome to come down and visit us at any time. Happy to show you what it looks like to be at a large material manufacturer. One of the key points that we've felt has been probably overlooked in this whole idea about what do we do with plastics is this area of designing for recyclability. If you don't start with materials, and again, this is materials across the entire spectrum of materials, not just plastics, but also paper and metal and glass. If you don't design with the idea that it's going to be recycled or reused or repurposed in some way, you've already designed for failure. So we need to make sure we're designing for success. Within Dow, we're talking primarily about looking at monomaterial solutions, whether it's in flexible packaging or other applications. Those monomaterial solutions are easier to blend together. You're not talking about dissimilar materials, polar and nonpolar materials. You're talking about materials that, if they are mechanically recycled, stand a better chance of producing a higher value product at the end of the day. Of course, if I'm going to be talking about designing for recyclability, I also have to be talking about actually incorporating that post-consumer recyclet back into products today. It really isn't that easy to do. It sounds like you just take one uh, component, you take the other component, you throw it into an extruder, and magically something appears. Sure, that could happen, but it doesn't necessarily happen because, again, as Dr. Fitzgerald described, it goes through repeated thermal cycles. Thermal cycles necessarily cause some type of cross-linking to occur, some type of degradation. That, of course, means you have a loss in mechanical properties, a loss in optical properties. All those things, at the end of the day, the consumer says, why do I want that? That doesn't look the same as the other material that I had before when I used this particular soft drink bottle or I used this particular shampoo bottle. I want to have exactly the same experience. So working towards getting to that experience is part of what we're doing. The other part of that, of course, is what we call feedstock recycling. Some people are more familiar with the term chemical recycling. Some people talk about advanced recycling. What we're really talking about is coming back to that basic building block. Again, whether you're talking about polyethylene or you're talking about polyurethane, those building blocks is what are what we spend a lot of time and energy in creating, and we want to get those back so we can design new materials going forward, again, building out that circular economy. The last part of this strategy that we have at Dow is really at looking at what does that bio-based feedstock source look like. There are a lot of collaborations being announced, have been announced over the past three or four years, where the presence of bio-based feedstocks, and I'm not talking about growing material, I'm about talking about using the waste byproducts and actually converting those back into new materials. This is an area of an intense interest throughout the industry. It is universities, it is companies, 
it is the government. Everybody is looking at ways to basically take waste products and convert them back into new materials. So I'll give you just a really brief overview on recycling technologies, only to address the three points on the far right-hand side of the graphic, which is as we're talking about those differences, whether we're talking about mechanical recycling or depolymerization or feedstock recycling, there are three challenges that we have to address. The first is the availability and the quality of those feedstocks. Not um, necessarily looking at everything as if it were the same. A lot of people believe plastic is plastic. People that are in the material science world say, no, you can't say that. Polyurethane is not PVC. PVC is not PET. So those materials need to be considered as their individual components and what they can bring, again, to those feedstocks that we're going to be recycling. The second part of it is the technology to process this. And this was mentioned before, when we talk about the heat and energy that goes into making those materials, if you put a lot of heat and energy out into the, making those materials, you actually have to put a lot of heat and energy back in to break those apart. This is great chemical engineering, right? So if you're not thinking about the right way to actually reprocess those materials, chances are your carbon footprint is going to go in the wrong direction. And the truth of the matter is that when we're talking about feedstock recycling, your carbon footprint tends to be larger than when you're talking about mechanically recycling materials. So those types of considerations need to be brought to bear when we're thinking about what is the technology portfolio that we should have front and center when we're developing, again, plastics for a circular economy. The last part is one I already talked about, which is what are those markets for those products that we're producing? Again, if we're not thinking about downcycling, if we're thinking about how do we upcycle, how do we find markets for those materials that perhaps we hadn't thought about before, it requires us to go out of the markets in which we participated in the past to look for those opportunities as well. So I'll give you an example of a couple of things that Dow has done over the past year in terms of what I'll call collaborative project launches. Um, we recently launched a product called Agility CE for collation shrink, which incorporates 70% post-consumer recyclic. Um, that's a product that, again, is what the brand owners are really calling for, the material suppliers and the converters to bring forward to them. We developed a strategic partnership with Bumera in, in Brazil, where we're actually working with a waste collaborative to generate new PCR streams in order to, again, supply those products to the marketplace today. And we also recently announced an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding with SCG Thailand, to develop, again, both feedstock recycling as well as mechanical recycling opportunities. The last thing, again, the other reason why you definitely want to come to Freeport is to actually see a road made from recycled plastics. And yes, it's actually called Plastics Road. It was called Plastics Road before we did this project. It'll be called Plastics Road way after I leave and retire from Dow. Um, so one of the reasons that this was enabled was because we were taking some chemistries that allow us to actually blend a mostly polyethylene material with a mostly not polyethylene material. So if you're familiar with asphalt chemistry, you know it's highly polar. It contains a lot of bitumen and other materials that generally don't blend well. And we enabled that by using some of the chemistries that we've created and actually can, in this case, be, take 1,000 pounds of plastic that would otherwise be going to the landfill and put it into a kilometer of road. So if you think about the number of opportunities for us to develop infrastructure based on the reuse of plastics, the possibilities are actually quite limitless. But none of this gets done, again, in a vacuum. Um, I think Ganesh will talk a little bit about the Alliance to End Plastic Waste, so I told him I wouldn't talk about it. Um, but it is probably one of the most telling examples of where the industry, the plastics industry, and the plastics value chain have come together and decided that it is better for us to work as an industry to solve this plastics in the environment problem rather than to come together with different solutions. So I appreciate the time. I love the fact that I've been invited to speak with such a diverse group of people and look forward to your questions. All right. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm delighted to have an opportunity to talk about a problem which is really new to most academics. Uh, my background is at, at the university, and like my colleague Megan, we actually have two jobs. One is teaching students what we already know. The second is imagining what the future looks like. And we don't have to be realistic. We don't have to be short-term in our thinking. We really have to be just very creative. That, that's what we are, um, that's what we are uh, excited about doing. And so I, I'm going to, to try to be forward-looking today and tell you 
what academics are thinking about now, imagining what we could do with plastics, what their second life could be. So to set the framework for this discussion, uh, briefly, I will say that there are three important things to remember. First of all, plastics have a lot of energy in them. Their manufacture requires a lot of energy and they inherently have energy. Polyethylene, for example, dozens of megajoules per kilogram of polyethylene goes into taking ethane, making ethylene from it, then polymerizing the ethylene to make the polyethylene. And part of that is the feedstock energy. Part of it is that the dehydrogenation is a very high, um, highly energy demanding process. But even the polymerization itself, which is actually exothermic, it releases heat, even that process done in these enormous reactors requires a, a, a fair amount of energy. It seems then, when we think about these materials that perhaps we use as packaging um, or for transportation, we use them for a few minutes or a few hours, that taking those high energy materials and simply discarding them was perhaps not the best thing to do with all of that energy. We're, we're, th we're throwing it away. We can burn it. And there are countries that do that as part of their strategy for dealing with plastic waste as an alternative to landfilling. And you can recover some energy that way. Usually there's a question at this point about, is that not actually the, most, the smartest thing to do? Let's just get the energy back out by burning it. But the energy that you recover is nowhere near the energy that you invested in making these materials in the first place. So while, while combustion is probably part of the solution, it's not the smartest thing to do in all cases. The second thing to know about plastics is that they are highly engineered materials. Each one, each type of plastic is actually many, many grades, and each one is specially designed for its purpose. So all of the materials you see here are made out of polyethylene. Polyethylene can be used to stop bullets. It's in bulletproof vests, if you can believe that. It's also in those uh, ubiquitous plastic bags, which, which some parts of the country have now banned, that weigh only a few grams, and, and they're um, incredibly thin and light. That humble plastic bag, which weighs a few grams, can actually carry thousands of times its own weight. In, 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 and think about the, the engineering that went into making that possible. It's a remarkable material. So the problem here is that if we talk about let's recycle polyethylene, well, which polyethylene? And what are you gonna make from the polyethylene? Do you want your bulletproof vests being made from discarded plastic bags? Do you want your food containers being made from discarded medical polyethylene? Um, th there's all kinds of questions here about how to do this. These, these are very different materials. And, and this is just one type of polymer. Uh, there are actually many of these. So lots of, lots of interesting questions about what the strategies ought to be. And the third thing to remember is that our, our need for plastics is huge and it continues to grow. The, the growth in, in plastic is bigger than the growth in many other commodities. Uh, in the last 40 years or so, we've, we've sort of tripled the amount of steel that the world uses, quadrupled the amount of aluminum, the amount of plastic has increased by a factor of six. And this exponential growth curve is continuing. We, f we keep finding new ways to use these. More of the world starts to get richer and starts to want to use these too. This is not a problem that's going to be solved by telling people to stop using plastics. All right, so the, the, um, the idea then is to start thinking about what we can do that overcomes this, what is now largely a linear use um, or, or supply chain that takes uh, raw materials, turns them into plastics, and then discards them. Uh, and this, is, this describes very well almost all of the plastics that we use today, uh, particularly the, the packaging, which is represented here, the 78 million tons of very short use plastics. So we want to think about this differently. The, the idea is how to, how to design ways to reuse that material to extract its energy value, to extract its chemical value, and to avoid having to make so much of this material brand new uh, and, and invest resources in it. So, end of life options. What can we do now and what might we do differently in the future? The idea is that these materials now currently mostly come from petroleum feedstocks, naphtha being one of those. From that we derive the building blocks, the monomers that make up the polymers, and the polymers go into making consumer goods. What do we do with those consumer goods? Well, when we're done with them, we can put them in the landfill. And if you want to be very optimistic about that, 
that is a form of carbon sequestration, okay? We're thinking very hard now about how to take carbon out of the atmosphere. You should think about putting it back in the atmosphere when it, there's such a good way to bury it if you just bury your plastics. That's one possibility, okay? It's not necessarily the best one. Um, you can burn it, as I mentioned before. You can recover the energy from it. That generates the CO2. That's the opposite of carbon sequestration, okay? We can reuse it. And sometimes you can directly reuse, sometimes there, you, you use it in, in other sort of similar but not quite as demanding applications. That's really what most people think of as recycling. And so that, that's sort of the, the mix that we have today. We're starting to think more about depolymerizing polymers, how to make that possible, how to do it in, a, in an energy efficient and clean and selective way. It's called feedstock recovery. We can get the, the components back out and we can polymerize them again and make new polymers. We can also do pyrolysis, make liquids out of polymers and use those liquids as fuels because of their high energy content. Of course, then that we burn those fuels and we end up generating CO2. So these last two, the feedstock recovery and the pyrolysis, um, are, are also thought of as downcycled applications. We are, we are making products out of these beautiful materials, these highly engineered materials that are of considerably less value than the material that, that they came from. And so I'm, I, as um, other speakers have already mentioned, there is a lot of interest now in thinking about creating an economic driver for recovering plastics and creating a circular economy from plastics by thinking of ways to cre create value. That means upcycling. All right, so I'll give you a few very, very quick um, ideas that have come out of research that is, is going on right now. These are all recently, very recently published. This first example comes from NREL. It involves reclaimed plastic waste. And um, I have to say that um, Dr. Pepper was not awarded his PhD for his participation in this project. But the, the uh, researchers in this project did actually take re reclaimed polyethylene um, polyethylene terephthalate from poly reclaimed PET from Dr. Pepper bottles and turn it into new materials. The strategy involves taking a catalyst to partially take, about, take apart the polymer and then repolymerizing it with new monomers. In this case, the new monomers were bio-based. They were derived from plants. They contained uh, unsaturated carbon-carbon double bonds in them, which allowed the researchers to cross-link and make new thermoset materials from these. And a techno-economic analysis of this entire process yielded the hopeful, um, um, the hopeful outcome that these could actually be economically viable recycling strategies for, for PET bottles. Um, there are other examples of, of more complete depolymerization to the actual um, chemical components of these polymers. These are hydrogenolysis reactions. That means that hydrogen is involved in taking the polymers apart. There's also a catalyst involved here. In this case, it's, it's the rather complex looking ruthenium catalyst. So these have to be very carefully designed for the function that they're, um, that they're intended for. But the idea is that you can take different polyesters or polycarbonates and, um, and break them apart into small molecules which become liquids or solids that are easy to purify and then um, high quality products can be made from those, um, from those deconstructed parts because they are chemically, chemically pure at the end. Um, and finally, we come back to the, the really difficult problem and that's the polyolefins. Jill already mentioned how, how much of the, the plastics that we make today are actually polyolefins, things like polyethylene and polypropylene and how, how tricky that problem is to deal with. These are polymers that are much harder to take apart in the ways that I, I just um, described for, for PET. And that's because when you polymerize ethylene to make polyethylene, it's, a, it's an exothermic process. You're gonna have to add a lot of energy back in if you wanna take it back to ethylene. And so we think about, are there other things that we can do? And when you think that way, you think, what else do we actually make from ethylene? Well a ton of things actually, things like aromatics, oxygenates, surfactants, alpha olefins, there's, there's lots of products that we also make from ethylene. And the question is, can we take our polyethylene and make those things without going through ethylene again? So can we, can we go back to some of these more interesting and much more valuable molecules um, in, in an efficient way? This is also going to be um, a project that requires a lot of catalyst design, a lot of 
process design, a lot of careful thinking about how to do it, and of course there are other issues about how to get the material, clean it up, separate it, and those kinds of things. Um, and th there's not very many examples of this yet. I have only one to give you, and it, it's just been published, it's just appeared online. Um, this is a, a, a project um, led by Argonne National Lab, but it's part of a, a, a group of researchers that I'm working with, taking polyethylene and, and converting it into a fairly narrow molecular weight range of high quality liquids over this particular catalyst, which is uh, platinum nan nanoparticles dispersed on strontium titanate. And so it is possible, we are, we are seeing actually the very earliest stages now of creative researchers thinking about ways to use these polymers to make things that people really want. And as soon as we make things that people really want, we have an economic driver for the upcycling, which means that we have a, a motivation to start solving this problem of very, very low um, recovery rates and reuse rates for plastics. All right, thank you very much. Yeah, good evening. Uh, thank you very much for the University of Houston for um, inviting, me, inviting me to this uh, sustainability panel on the future of plastics, and thanks, uh, and Professor Robertson. Um, yeah, I think Professor Robertson you know, provided a very clear picture of uh, the sustainability life cycle. I think she very fairly and accurately captured what are some of the challenges and the issues around uh, the, uh, the plastics in general, the petrochemical feedstock, the energy associated with it, the recyclability, the recoverability, the designing for uh, recyclability and the like. To us, uh, the problem is not the plastic. It, it is the waste. You know, it's a disposal of waste that's a problem. Now, I'll talk a little bit about, you know, a lot of the speakers uh, prior to me uh, spoke about, you know, the value of plastic, how wonderful it is. You know, the disadvantage of being the last person on the panel here is I got to repeat some of the things they said. So just bear with me. <laughs> but nevertheless, it's, it's important to hear again, right? Um, so I'll... I'll I'll talk a little specifically about what Lionel Bissell is doing towards advancing some of the sustainable solutions. Uh, some of it is very similar to what others are working on, but, it's, uh, uh, but in some ways they are different as well. So l let's uh, look at what, not what we are doing here. How do I go back to the presentation mode here? Can you change it back to the... Uh, just before I get into uh, my presentation here, just a little bit of uh, background about Lionel Bissell. I'm not sure how many of you know who Lionel Bissell is. Uh, if you don't run into one of the Dow plants, you will run into one of the Lionel Bissell plants in the Gulf Coast. Uh, so, uh, so we are uh, one of the largest producers of uh, uh, petrochemicals, uh, like polyethylene and polypropylene. Uh, polypropylene, we are the largest producer of polypropylene in the world and we are the largest producer of polyethylene in the world. Uh, so we make a lot of the products, uh, materials, and solutions that are advancing uh, solutions for tomorrow, today and tomorrow. Uh, so this is a slide, uh, it's a little bit of an eye chart, but I think hopefully you can see it. I think uh, uh, Nicole talked about uh, some of the advantages of uh, polymers in general. You know, you, you see that in every box of your life, right? You, you know, it's used in medical application, the syringes when you go to a hospital, they're made out of plastic. Uh, the food packaging that you buy at a grocery store, that's made out of uh, plastic. You know, they extend the shelf life. Uh, they help uh, transport you know, food from one place to another, uh, another part of the world, right? Uh, and they're lightweight. They're used in automotive applications, right? It makes your car more efficient, fuel efficient. Uh, they're used in solar panels, uh, wind, tur wind turbines and the like. So, Plastics as a whole has a lot of benefits, right? You know, if you look at you know, what is the most sustainable material, we would argue plastics perhaps is the most sustainable material. Um, you know, if you were to replace all the plastics we use today in the United States, you're going to use about 55 million metric tons more of an alternate material. Uh, it's going to take you 80% more energy, about 130% more in greenhouse gas emissions. So. It, it, again, it's not the plastic that's a problem, it's a waste handling, right? How the end of life, how, how the plastic is disposed and handled, that is the problem. Um, so we don't be believe the plastic should end up in our rivers, in our, in our oceans, in our water streams. 
Uh, you know, we need to be responsible citizens. We need to be a responsible uh, producer in terms of uh, addressing that challenge. And I think, uh, um, you know, I'll talk a little bit about how the industry is coming together in addressing uh, the plastic waste. Specifically at Lionel Basel, uh, what, what we are doing is we look at three things, right? The three focus areas that primarily addresses the the four quadrants that um, uh, Professor Robertson talked about in her uh, sustainability life cycle, if you will. Uh, number one is uh, talking about sustainable technologies and solutions, uh, you know, that are also you know, that are profitable for your business. In our business, we include sustainability is embedded in our pro in our, in, our, in our business model. Um, we are looking at a number of different technologies and how we advance this uh, sustainability of uh, polymer products. Um, and the second thing I want to talk about is uh, how the industry as a whole is coming together and collaborating uh, the Alliance for Plastic Waste in providing solutions, not just here, globally. And lastly, you know, we as Lionel Basel have made a commitment to reduce our carbon dioxide footprint by 15% by year 2030. So we are trying to address uh, sustainability on all fronts. You know, when you, uh, when you talk about, you know, sustainability, you know, I believe that you have to take a holistic view. You know, I, I mentioned earlier that, you know, uh, the alternate materials take about 80% more energy, about 130% more in greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so that ought to be considered as you look at alternate solutions. You know, some of them are not as friendly as you might think, you know, when you try to replace plastic with something else. Again, the, the issue is addressing the plastic waste, not the plastic as a material. Uh, so what uh, we at Lionel Basel is doing is that uh, we are looking at, if you look at this, um, you know, the wheel uh, out here, um, the three areas we are working on, uh, the one that down at the bottom called QCP or quality circular polymers. Uh, we have formed a you know, joint venture with uh, one of the largest uh, waste handlers in Europe uh, called Suez. Uh, They're like the waste management here in the in Houston area, Republic Services. Uh, we, we came together to form this uh, joint venture primarily to advance the mechanical recycling. Um, you know, when we look at the solutions, you know, we don't think there's one solution that fits all, right? You know, me mechanical recycling has a place, uh, but it has limitations like as everybody else talked about it. So it's one of the least, you know, energy intensive, it's less capital intensive, but it's got limitations in, in terms of, you know, where you can use it, how you can use it, what applications you can use it. I think somebody mentioned the uh, food packaging, medical packaging, or pharmaceutical packaging, you got some limitations on using uh, those mechanical recycled products in, into those applications. And it's, again, it's also not very scalable technology, right? It's a very small scale um, operation. You talked about, uh, Professor Rob Robertson talked about about 380 million metric tons of polymer that's used out there, right? So those, this mechanical recycling is a very small operation. A typical operation is about 35 kilotons to 50 kilotons in capacity, so they're not very big in addressing the challenges. Um, so what we believe is uh, molecular recycling, or what we call as the Morchek. Uh, it is a way of chemical recycling. We are trying to break, it, break the polymers back into, uh, into olefins, primarily ethylene and poly, you know, pro propylene. Uh, but one of the ways we are trying to differentiate is to develop a scalable technology, right? Um, uh, Dr. Scott talked about you know, alternate uses of those uh, molecules, but we believe those molecules can be put back into use to make polyethylene and polypropylene again. And one of the ways uh, we are trying to be differential is to use uh, the catalytic uh, process. You know, we, we are one of the you know, pioneers in uh, licensing technologies around the world in terms of polyethylene and polypropylene. So we want to make it more efficient, right? Uh, today's, a lot of the pyrolysis units are about 25 kiloton, very small scale operations. We want to build a larger scale, re reduce the energy intensity, increase the efficiency of uh, pyrolysis, our chemical recycling, so to speak, and bring those you know, ethylene molecules, propylene molecules, back into polyethylene and polypropylene. So it is upcycling. The products you make are the same quality product as the virgin products that you would otherwise buy from a you know, crude oil base or a fossil-based resource that we use today. So it, it is, again, bringing, giving it a new life, bring it back to... Uh, its molecules and make polyethylene and polypropylene again. And the third focus area for us is on uh, bioplastics. We call that circulant. Uh, recently, we announced a joint venture with a company called Nesti. It's one of the largest biorefiners in, in Europe. Um, so what they do is, uh, you know, one of the things that you need to consider about bioplastics is, you know, where you're 
feedstock is coming from? What is the resource for your biofeedstock? Um, when you talk about plant-based or vegetable-based feedstock, you need to look at that from a perspective of are you, are you competing against a food resource, right? You know, so that is a debate that we all have, right? We, we don't want to create another problem by uh, using that corn that could otherwise be used as a food resource and driving up the prices. So the, the way we are looking at it is using you know, spent vegetable oil, industrial oils, uh, that, that would otherwise be disposed, right? So we are trying to use that and, uh, and again, make polymers uh, from a bio-based uh, feedstock. So we had made some commercial quantities today, and we are testing that with a lot of the brand owners, such as uh, Unilever's of the world in Europe, and trying to uh, offer a different solution, right? Again, the, the, the advantage of biopolymers is it reduces your carbon footprint. Uh, but it also has limitations in terms of scalability. You know, you, you don't have the vast resources of uh, the spent vegetable oil to make 380 million metric tons of, you know, polymers, if you will, right? So that's, that's a challenge. The cost is another issue, right? And the infrastructure is another issue. Uh, and another challenge is in terms of certification, right? When you talk about biocontent in your polymers, how do you know how much of biocontent is there in the product you're making? So you pretty much have to have an infrastructure that is integrated. You know, you keep, get, take a feedstock, put it through a cracker, and you, go, you know, put it through a polymerization unit all in one place. And if you look at the infrastructure in, in the Houston, everything is pipeline. Everything gets mixed everywhere. I can't tell you the propylene molecule that I get is used to make polypropylene, or used to make polypropylene oxide. We, we don't know. Once it enters our facility, it can go anywhere. So there are some real challenges in terms of standards and how you you know, um, have you, you know, credit those uh, C14 content, if you will, in terms of carbon. Uh, C14 is something you can measure from a bio-based resource. Uh, you can certify the polymer is a biopolymer. Um, so there are some real challenges around that. But we, so we are working on all three technologies. The last one I didn't mention, but it's also on this slide, is energy recovery. Uh, we believe that's part of the solution. I think... Uh, Dr. Scott talked about the, the calorific value of those polymers. You can recover a lot of the energy. After all, it is a byproduct of you know, crude oil, right? You know, you're fractionating it. You're making polymers from, a, from a crude oil. One of the you know, feedstocks comes from crude oil, right? So that you can capture a lot of that energy. Um, I think by some estimate, you can, if you take all the waste that's uh, going to landfill today, the municipal solid waste in, in the U.S., you can power about 14 million homes. Uh, you know, and fuel about 9 million cars. So that, that is part of the solution. And, but in some countries, you know, it's, it's not looked up favorably, favorably because it's not circular. But uh, we think it's part of the solution, I think. Okay. So I, I want to show you a little video clipping of the, the molecular recycling. Uh, we recently announced a pilot plant at a facility at one of our research centers in Italy. Um, there's no audio here. Is there an audio for the video? Okay, I have to narrate, okay. All right. <laughs> so so w w what we do is, it's like we, t we take the, um, uh, we, t we take the, the municipal solid waste and it goes through what we call a material recovery facility where it gets sorted into different streams. And if any of you looked at uh, the recycling code and any of the packages, you know, you see number ones, number twos, number fives is polypropylene, number two is high-density polyethylene, the one is PET. So we kind of go through these material recovery facilities. They sort them into different polymers, if you will. Um, the one advantage of the molecular re recycle is uh, some of the more difficult to recycle uh, materials, uh, such as the multi-material packages, multi-layer packages, the stand-up pouches uh, that you see. Uh, they can be shredded and put it through this uh, process here. Uh, it, again, uh, goes through uh, a pyrolysis unit where with temperature and catalysis, you break it down into its molecules, and then th that propylene and ethylene becomes the feedstock for your uh, process. Okay. Uh, next uh, couple of slides, I'll uh, deviate from, uh, you know, from, from what Lionel Bussell is doing, uh, but talk a little bit about the alliance to end plastic. Um, you know, we see this as, as Dow, as Lionel Bassel, you know, we see this as a social license to operate, right? And we want to be a responsible participant in the industry. So what we have done is, um, you know, along with uh, Dow and uh, Lionel Bassel, you know, we are one of the founding 
members of uh, Alliance for Plastic Waste. Today we have about 40 different companies representing the different value stream, you know, be it the uh, resin producers, converters, like people that make the packages, the brand owners, uh, and some of the technology providers here uh, in terms of sorting technologies. We have come together as an industry and pledged about one and a half billion dollars uh, in terms of supporting the various activities. Uh, you know, one thing I forgot to mention when you talk about plastic waste, uh, the big ocean patch you saw in some of the pictures, um, you know, there are about 10 rivers in the world that contribute to over 90% of the plastic um, marine debris that you see there. And those 10 rivers are in Southeast Asia, in India, in Africa. And that's where the biggest problem is. Uh, so, and that, that's what the Alliance is trying to address today is to you know, promote projects uh, we look at four pillars. Right? One is the, the infra infrastructure development. In many parts of this world, there is no real infrastructure in terms of collecting. In the U.S., you know, you saw 75% of our municipal waste goes into la landfill. Even though it goes into landfill, it is contained. It's not leaking into the environment. But in many places, there is no infrastructure uh, to collect, manage waste. Right? So the, the Alliance is promoting projects to develop those infrastructure. Uh, you know, increase recycling. The second thing we are looking at is innovation. How do we advance these new technologies? I talked about chemical recycling, mechanical recycling, you know, bioplastics. You know, how do we advance these technologies? We want to innovate by coming together, uh, getting ideas from people. You know, if, you, if, you, if any of you have an idea, you can submit your proposal. The Alliance would, would be happy to look at and fund those projects. Uh, and we got, today we have about 400 projects that's in the pipeline that come from people all walks of life in the different parts of the world, right? Primarily in Indonesia, India, and other places, we get a lot of projects. And the third pillar we look at is the education and engagement. Um, it's just not enough as an industry, we, we, you know, we talk about this, we want to work with the NGOs. We need to have a you know, govern, government policy that supports it, uh, supports the investment in recycling infrastructure, a policy that supports chemical recycling, right? You know, Texas is further ahead compared to many other places in terms of regulating chemical recycling or plastic waste as a material resource, as a fuel, as opposed to a waste. When you call it a waste, you're subject to different regulations. In, in Texas, it's considered as a fuel or a, as a material resource. So we, we can invest in a lot of those technologies. We need those support from the you know, governments. And the lastly, right, you know, what is out there in the environment, we want to clean up. And that we, we take that very seriously. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, the few projects the Alliance is working on. Uh, first and foremost, you know, we want to build a global information project, right? Without reliable data, you don't know where to focus on. So the, the Alliance is spending a lot of resource in collecting where the leakages are occurring, where the material flows are happening in terms of the plastic waste. Uh, we are working with city partnerships, many communities. Uh, we call a project stop. You know, we got a project going on in uh, Jakarta, Indonesia, where we are developing the infrastructure to collect plastic waste. A big one is uh, uh, Renew Oceans uh, is uh, working on a project cleaning up River Ganga. That's one of the ten rivers I talked about contributing to 90% of the over 90% of the plastic waste. Uh, there's a massive project that's going on today with Renew Oceans. Um, this is an interesting model, right? You know, one of the things they are doing is employing the local women, empowering the local people, educating them, right? Um, these are otherwise being done by an informal sector, right? These women actually, they have an employment. They pick the, uh, the plastic waste from the rivers and the water streams, and they're teaching them how to use their chemi small chemical recycling units. So they're installing them in places along the river, along the banks of River Ganga, and they could make their own fuel. Instead of kerosene that they buy from the outside, they're able to use that as a fuel, and you know, make, make a living out of it. So th this is a very interesting project. I think National Geography is uh, filming the whole project, so if any of you look up on the you know, Nat Geo, you should be able to see some of the things that are going on there. And we also have an incubator network. There's a Circulate Capital and Second Muse. We are funding technologies and projects around the globe. Again, like I said, if any of you have an interesting idea, please submit at um, you know, info at alliance2nplasticwaste.org. Uh, the Alliance would be very happy to look at those projects. And we're also collaborating with the United Nations and the like. So with that, um, I'll be happy to sit and take any questions. And th thanks again uh, for the opportunity.
Okay, so now we're going to start the Q&A portion, and I have a list of the questions you've been submitting, so I'll <coughs> be selectively asking questions for the panel to address. So first, I want to start off um, a little bit on a bigger picture, <coughs> in that, um, you know, all of you have mentioned that there are a variety of different ways that we could deal with plastic waste and as an alternative to landfilling. And we particularly look at the large rate of landfilling in the U.S. So incineration, um, chemical versus mechanical recycling, even gasification, pyrolysis. So uh, what are the pros and cons of these? And where should we be focusing our energy, um, particularly in, in the United States? Yeah, I mean, is it on? Can you hear me? Yeah, you can hear me. Yeah, as I mentioned in my presentation, you know, we don't think there's one solution mm -hmm. that fits all, right? The, the mechanical recycling as a place, it's mm -hmm. the least capital intensive uh, way of, uh, you know, recovering plastic mm -hmm. waste, mm -hmm. but it has its limitations, right? The scale, uh, the limitations that induce, and the number of products that you can make out of that. I think uh, Professor Scott mentioned about the number of different grades. If you ask Dow how many polyethylene grades they make, and if you ask us how many polyethylene grades we make, there's mm -hmm. over 50 to 100 different types of polyethylene grades that we make. Mm -hmm. Same thing with polypropylene, because it, each one has a different purpose. You know, each package is made differently. Each converting process is different. So we have to tailor the products to, for those applications, right? So thereby, the mechanical recycling has a very limited application, if you will. And the biggest issue is on using food or FDA type applications, medical applications and pharmaceutical applications. I don't think any of you want your product that's not FDA compliant, right, to be put back into those as a post-consumer recycle. Mm -hmm. um, chemical recycling, on the other hand, has a potential to be a game changer in the sense um, it's got more meaningful, impactful process in terms of scalability, you know, uh, by converting back into its olefins and making the polymer again, you're able to, you know, advance those products into different applications that I mentioned, right? Um, one uh, the difficulty in that is the, the scalability, right? Today's technology is limited to very small scale operation. They're small modules. It's energy intensive. Um, you know, it's, um, um, you know, the efficiency is not as good as well. So, so what we are looking at is using catalysis to increase the efficiency, thereby you can, you know, uh, have a better e heat transfer, you can scale it to a higher uh, capacities, if you will, like 200 kilotons is what we talk about, right? So, and if you do that, you know, it's going to provide a number of different products that you already make, and it could be used in the same applications as, as the virgin resin that we have been using. Um, you know, bioplastics, well, again, it, it is, I think I mentioned that in my presentation, the limitation is availability of feedstock, and you need to be mindful about whether or not you're competing with a food resource. You don't create another problem. Um, you know, some of the biodegradable polymers, okay, they got an issue with functionality, but there's also issue with the greenhouse gas emission. We look at the whole life cycle analysis of how you make them. So there are pros and cons, but as a whole, we believe everything has a place. Uh, and the, the solution is many. Uh, the approach is going to be different d depending on where you are. And different regions have different limitations, uh, different infrastructure. Is, that's why the alliance is looking at, we call them archetypes, right? You know, finding places where have similarities and creating solutions for those, you know, geographies or regions or, um, you know, if it's an infrastructure issue with similar infrastructure, finding solutions to those geographies. So it, it's going to depend on, you know, the nature of the uh, place. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anyone like to add anything to that? No, I, don't think mm. I think when we're talking about um, scale, and uh, Ganesh has already talked about it a little bit, if you're thinking about any of these processes as immediate solutions for solving, again, the plastics in the environment issue, it's probably a misleading conception. Right. Um, they're very large scale processes that are run today that manufacture thousands of kilotons of material every year. Um, and we got there because we looked at how do we optimize those processes? How do we get to scale? I mean, the chemical industry has for 
100, 200 years been looking at optimization of processes, and right now we've gotten to a place where we have optimized so that you can run at scale and provide, again, convenience for the consumers. These materials are ones that we make at large quantities at prices that make it easy for consumers to buy what they want to buy. So to get to that stage where we say, okay, you know what, I want to create a circular economy, which is the right solution? Is it gasification? Is it pyrolysis? Is it mechanical recycling? The answer is yes, yes, and yes. Um, but you have to think about what is it easiest to develop to scale in the most rapid way in the country in which you want to solve the problem, as well as how do you look at minimization of life cycle impact. The worst thing that we could do is to develop a series of unintended consequences right. that put us in a situation where we've negatively impacted um, some other um, aspect of the environment by choosing to, again, address the plastics and the environment problem. Megan, I think it's really important to think about the collection and separation efficiency part of this when you think about what the, what the right solution is. If collection is not going to happen, then biodegradability is, the, is perhaps the solution to look at. If you can collect, but the separation is very difficult, uh, perhaps energy recovery is the right solution. If you can collect and you can separate and you can get materials that are reasonably good, then mechanical recycling or chemical recycling become very feasible options. So it, it, it's not just about how do you recycle, but it's about where does that plastic come from in the first place and what kind of mixture is it a part of? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, one thing I forgot to mention is when you talk about these large scale plants, let's say 200 kiloton chemical uh, pyrolysis or chemical recycling units, you pretty much have to be located in a high population center where you've got high, large access to waste streams. Otherwise, you'll be transporting mm -hmm. waste all around the world, which is something you mm -hmm. don't want to do. Mm -hmm. You know, um, um, as uh, Dr. Martin mentioned, right? You know, you, you know, the the chemical infrastructure here in the Gulf Coast is very, very efficient. We move everything by pipelines. We move propellers through rail cars. It's the most efficient way to transport pellets. Mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, pi pipelines is the most efficient way to transport those molecules, right? And uh, so that is a huge infrastructure here. When you start mm -hmm. moving this waste around the world, then you're going to create another issue, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. I think we've already been through mm -hmm. moving waste around the world. Right, exactly. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Specifically on the idea of recycling, uh, what factors have led other areas of the world, such as Europe, to have higher recycling rates? And what can we learn from those areas? What, what policies or actions can we take here uh, <laughs> to improve our rate of recycling? I, I can take a first shot at that. Yeah, you can. Okay, <laughs> all right. So uh, I had the fortune earlier this year to be in Europe and visit my colleagues who are in England and they're in Germany and they're in Switzerland and they're in France. And the one thing they say that really is super effective is if you basically tell people they'll have to pay money if they don't effectively mm -hmm. recycle. Mm -hmm. um, Switzerland, if you have had an opportunity to live there, you have family who lives there, you know the number of different streams that they have is tremendous and they pay by the kilo in terms of disposing into mm -hmm. landfill. Um, so we always talk about how we want to have sustainable solutions, but there is a cost associated with it. I think Bill Nye, the science guy, did a great video a couple of months ago um, talking about how it's, it's not free and so we need to figure out how we can balance the cost of infrastructure. I'm not going to look at Nicole like she's the proxy for the government, but <laughs> you're the proxy for the government tonight, I'm sorry. <laughs> right. um, but I, I think there is an element of how do you afford sustainability that is not just about um, who is going to invest, is it about the alliance, it's not just about the alliance, it's about the government, it's about individuals. And I think that's what Europe has to some extent rightly or wrongly in every country figured out how to increase those recycling rates by sharing the cost of uh, sustainability. Right. Yeah, but, but keep, keep in mind, Europe was also exporting to China until they put the green fence, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, you talk about 16% versus 9%, and they do a lot of incineration. Yeah. And the one reason why Europe is not able to, uh, I mean, it's better at recycling is there are no landfill areas like here. The tipping fees are awfully more expensive. You know, in Houston area, you talk about dumping your municipal waste, $17 a ton. In Europe, it's over $100 a ton. So that's a different economic driver. So they are forced to export overseas. They're forced to recycle. They're forced to incinerate or waste your energy. And they, are, they also have what is called the extended producer responsibility. So they are taxing the, 
you know, the brand owners, the Unilevers, the Nestle's of the world mm -hmm. for putting those packages out there. So mm -hmm. when you talk about a value uh, you know, in mechanical recycling, today mm -hmm. in the U.S., it's not functional mm -hmm. because there is no value for them. They're mm -hmm. not making money. When oil prices are so cheap, the cost of mechanically recycling, sorting, and picking up that waste is more expensive than buying a virgin product. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you're not making money there, but in the Europe, it's other way around. There's an you know, extended producer responsibility that supports some of the infrastructure development uh, that supports recycling, right? So they're forced to recycle there. Mm -hmm. That's a huge difference when you talk about economic models. Uh, we are very different. You know, we can throw trash in landfill. It's the cheapest way. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you, you know, Houston may be collecting your uh, you know, uh, plastic waste separately in a different bin, but it's all landing, ending up in the landfill because they don't have value for it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, places like Katy, where I live, they don't even want glass in their you know, recycling anymore because there's so much glass out there, there's no value for it. Mm -hmm. That's the reality, right? So you know, that, that's why we have to create a value. And the demand is there today. I think a lot of the brand owners are talking about incorporating 25% or 50% post-consumer recycle. So that's going to drive the demand. Uh, but I, I, like, I like to say, you know, the brand owners have to put their money where their mouth is. These are going to be expensive, right? And they, they have to pay. So is that going to happen in 2025? We'll see. So I think regulation is part of this, and, and charging people is part of what, what creates differences around the world. I think there are different social pressures, too. Um, in Japan, for example, you know, recycling is, is, is a community activity, and, and you are... You are obliged to be part of your community and do this. The sum of that happens in California, where I'm from too. It's expected and that's why people do it. But I think that we can also learn something from the very successful recycling of things like aluminum cans, okay? And, and states in the US which give refunds for returning your aluminum cans have much higher recycling rates than states that don't have those. And, and what can we do to motivate people to want to recycle their plastics and to recycle them in a way that, that makes them easy to use again, which means separating them, which means cleaning them up, uh, those kinds of things. So there are, I think, both, both carrots and sticks that can be used to get the right kind of behavior to make this work well. I think the, the intent behind EPR is not to punish people, but to build a system. system the EPR is. is intended to build infrastructure so that you can recycle it. It's not just to say, hey, you're going to pay if you don't have a certain type of material. It really is intended to help build infrastructure. Right. I think that the European Union is also seeing the value of having this eco-modulation scheme as well, carrots and sticks, where you're rewarded for incorporation of PCR or down gauging or creating more monomaterial solution. So there's a good balance between, again, the carrot and the stick in order to make sure that people see that there's overall going to be a benefit to them from a social lifestyle perspective. And on the same subject of government policies, uh, what do you think about uh, examples where, say, a type of single-use plastic is banned, or say a straw is now made out of paper, or uh, single-use pick grocery bags are banned. What effect do those policies have? Do they have unintended consequences or is that another way to, to help solve this problem? I think yeah. that those policies have the effect of raising awareness and getting people um, more aware of what kind of problems mm -hmm. that they're causing. Uh, mm -hmm. In terms of the actual volume of plastics that are being removed mm -hmm. by those policies, mm -hmm. it's obviously very small. So. Mm -hmm. That's a very small fraction of our business, but nevertheless, but if you look at some of the alternatives that they're proposing, is thicker bags. Mm. Okay, it's so that doesn't really solve the problem. You're putting more plastic into the environment, and again, you know, we have to see plastic as a value. It shouldn't belong in the environment. It should not leak into the environment. It should not be in our water streams. You know that you know we support like store side uh, you know recycling. Uh, you know you can bring back your plastic bags to. Kroger or Home Depot, they all take them back. And so we are supporting those projects where you can bring back those you know, plastic bags and reuse them. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, bans always have unintended consequences, right? You, know, uh, you, you mentioned that, you know, a single, I don't know who mentioned that, but a plastic bag can carry many times its weight. Mm -hmm. right? I think you mentioned that, right? 
Um, so why is that, right? I mean, it's the most efficient material, and I, I mentioned the alternate material is if you replace with glass or metal, um, you know, the environmental cost is about four times higher than, you know, plastic. So, you know, which one are you trying to address? And if you look at your sustainability life cycle, you know, our existential threat may be on the climate change if you're using more energy or putting out more GHCs into the environment versus, you know, not disposing your plastic bag responsibly. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you got to think about the big picture here. There is actually a very good example from California right. of unintended consequences. So California now has a statewide ban on, on plastic grocery bags. Right. Um, and the, the researchers who studied this problem saw how much that, that decreased the use of plastic shopping bags. You know, you actually have to pay for them now if you, right. if you want, to, want them at the grocery store. So a big decrease in, in that use of plastic. But a, a simultaneous increase in the number of plastic trash bags that are sold by the grocery yeah, store, exactly right. right? <laughs> Which partially offsets the amount of plastic that you're not using because people, in effect, were using those plastic grocery bags for more than one purpose. So you you know you yeah. you 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 install a ban in one area and have one outcome, but it has other consequences. So I think we need to be very very aware of that as we design solutions because right. not thinking about it at a at a whole system level will lead to us overestimating the impact that we're having. Right. Yeah, the, the, the alternate bag that you're using from HEB or Kroger is still made out of polypropylene. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah, so my, my colleague calls that squeezing the balloon, right? So right. you go down in one area and go up in another area, so you have to be conscious of, you, again, are you squeezing the balloon and causing something right. to happen that you really didn't want to happen in the first place? Right. right. Mm -hmm. And we had a discussion around economic incentives, or in some cases, taxes, which can help offset some of the costs of, of recycling. Um, but in the end, uh, it, you know, they might have a great impact on the percentage of, of waste recycled. But how do we ensure that this doesn't disproportionately affect, um, say, people of less economic means? Will this have a larger impact on some communities versus others? Not an easy question. But <laughs> right. no, I, I yeah. think it could, right? I mean, the one reason why the food is mm. so cheap is you're able to package and transport easily across the globe, right? You know, um, anyway, so when you talk about you know, organic food today, and, and most poor communities are not able to up, you know, buy those products, right? You know, healthier products, and you talk about obesity, and you know, the same situation can happen if your food is not packaged and you know, transported uh, you know, across the different regions, different places. You know, some communities could be more impacted than others. Yeah, and that's why we're investing in technology solutions. Right, mm -hmm. exactly. Well, I think we have to be very sure that the technology solutions that we come up with are viable in all kinds of communities, that they're not just technology solutions for rich communities, rich countries. Um, and, and that means being very conscious of the economic costs, right? We, we can't just do recycling for the sake of it because it makes us feel good. It has to be it has to be economically make, make sense in all kinds of places. Right. And, and um, investing in the waste management systems in, mm -hmm. in those communities too is, is an yeah. extremely important part of the solution as well. Yeah, I think that's why the Alliance is focusing on all four things, right? You, you can invest in infrastructure and collection and managing the waste, but you don't, if you don't know what to do with it, right, how to mechanically recycle them or chemically recycle them, and create end markets for them, right? There is no value for it. So we are looking at the whole picture here, how to create end markets mm -hmm. so that there is a value. You know, without value, there's no point in capturing all this, you know, plastic waste. So, uh, so we are finding new applications. How do we take plastic, make, you know, roofing or, uh, or uh, replace gypsum boards, right, you know, with plastic mm -hmm. waste. And those are some things that the Alliance is looking at sponsoring. Mm -hmm. I want to come back to this, uh, this idea that, that Dr. Martin introduced, which is the design for recyclability. So I mean, what are other ways that we can think about implementing this on a larger scale um, to really enable a more efficient recycling economy? So I think one thing that we didn't really talk about, I, I mean, I talked a bit about more like molecular uh, design, but macro scale design of products so that the plastic components or the recyclable recyclable components are more easily removed. You see that a lot with vehicle 
uh, construction, how do you ensure that you know, a plastic panel can actually be slid out instead of having to put the whole car into the dump? Um, so I think that there's a lot of uh, macro scale design that needs to happen to ensure recyclability. Yeah, the, some of the other things we are looking into in terms of uh, you know, uh, improving recyclability of polymers is putting tracers in the products we make, right? Or you know, digital marking so that the, the sorting machines can ac accurately capture what product it is and sort them accordingly, right? So those are some technologies the industry is looking at and, you know, black master batch, for example, right, the near-infrared sorting machines are not capable of positively sorting black packages. Uh, a lot of the, you know, cosmetic packages are in black, right, you know. Um, so now we are developing new color chemistries that are more friendlier for uh, infrared, uh, near-infrared sorting. The tracers in the product will let you know this is polyethylene or polypropylene. Uh, the digital markings as well, you know, the, even if the product is deformed, mashed, you know, as it goes through the different value chain here through the sorting machines, uh, they can, you know, with a very small pixel, you should be able to identify what product it is. You know, these are some things that we are looking at, and obviously, uh, the mono material from multi layer packages to mono material packages, I think, uh, you know, Dow showed some examples, and you know, those are things that the industry is looking at, you know, eliminating lamination from your potato chip bag, and you know, how do you use uh, only polyethylene or polypropylene in those packages, you know, make it more recyclable friendly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wanna uh, ask a question which is relevant to a lot of the students in our audience, so if there are students who are interested in a career in the plastics industry or polymers industries, um, what advice do you have for them if they have concerns about sustainability and impact on the environment? Um, so advice for the students. <laughs> Plastics is great, right? <laughs> no, I mean, I, I think, again, as I said before, right, you know, I mean, that's what drives our economy here in Houston. You see a lot of the investments that are happening is in building new plastic, you know, plants. Um, again, the problem is not with the plastic as a material. It's the waste handling, how you treat them, how you use them after end of life, uh, you know, as the industry works towards a solution in promoting recyclability, recoverability. You know, we as an industry pledged by year 2040, 100% of every, uh, you know, plastic product that's out there is either recycled uh, or recovered or reused. Uh, that's a commitment as an industry we have made, and it's true here, it's true in Europe as well. Uh, so again, like I said, we want to be a responsible participant, and uh, I think industry is doing a lot of things. Um, I think that's going to change the, the plastics, uh, you know, the way people think of plastic you know, as a waste, um, and we have to be responsible in how you deal with the end of life situation here. Yeah, I think that um, if you have a strong background in um, polymer science or plastics and you have concerns about the future, um, I do think uh, a government career is the way to go. We get to, <laughs> um, we get to set the research agenda um, for scientists across the nation and ensure that uh, um, funding is going to the projects and the ideas that make the most sense for the future. So I think that that is a really um, exciting area to be in if that is your passion. Again, uh, you know, plastic packaging is not the only application for plastics. I showed you a number of different applications, right? The cars you drive, the cell phones you're using, everything, the clothes you wear, it's all plastic. <laughs> <laughs> right? I, I think this is an amazing time to be a student. There are so many possibilities, and we haven't worked out what they even are yet, let alone which ones are going to be viable. So if you wanted to get involved in imagining what those possibilities are, the field is really wide open, um, and, and you can do research in this area. You might be somebody who starts a small company to mm -hmm. do this on a small scale in your community, and, and you might find um, inspiration there but by the, the specific needs of your community. You might join a large company which has a lot of resources and a big stake in getting this solution to this problem right. Um, you could take these things around the world as well. I mean, th this is a, a, a real problem that needs a solution that needs the people who are going to be living with that solution for a long time to get involved now and be part of it. 
I do a lot of recruiting and interviewing at Dow, and every single one of the candidates who comes in wants to talk about sustainability. Right. And I say the same thing, minus the government job thing. <laughs> um, which is that if, you know, if I wanted to work for another 25 years, I could work for another 25 years right. in this, and I would have a rewarding and satisfying and technically challenging career. And I think that is the situation we're in. I think when people say, oh, I don't want to take that as a career, you know, plastics might go away. I think, no, I mean, if you're a problem solver, if you're an engineer and a right. scientist, this is the best possible time to get into plastics. Mm -hmm. yeah. that's, that's a great way to end. Yep. So I, I want to give each of you just a chance if you have any brief final thoughts. We're almost at time, but um, we'll just start uh, with you and go down the line. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, thank you, first of all, for this opportunity, and thank you for uh, you know, staying out late despite the mm -hmm. bad weather, and, and thank you, fellow panelists here. I think, uh, as I mentioned, you know, Lionel Bissell as a company, you know, we are committed to sustainability, and that is embedded in our you know, business model. You know, we are creating solutions for the future, like you know, I showed you some of the examples there. Uh, the, the solution for you know, this challenge is multi-pronged, different approaches are required. And it also re requires collaboration with the industry, with the NGOs, uh, with the communities. Uh, to you know, really solve this great challenge in front of us. I think you know, a lot of the brain, bright minds are in this room. You guys have great ideas. Like I said, uh, submit them to info at alliancerandplasticbase.org. Um, you know, it's, it's a great time to get, you know, get involved. Uh, again, uh, this is a social license for us to operate and we take that responsibility very seriously and you know, we are advancing solutions for tomorrow. And again, thank you for your participation. Mm -hmm. I think I'll end by saying environmental issues are really complicated. And this is one area where we cannot afford to get the answers wrong. We need to think about this carefully. We need to be, be cautious, and, but we need to be also very, very creative. We, we, we can't be limited by the solutions that are on the table now. There, there's going to be new things that come along. We need, to, we need to figure out what they are. We need to figure out all of their implications as we set about implementing them. So it, it's a complicated thing. And it's not just a technology challenge either. We've heard about the, the implications for, um, for different types of communities, different nations around the world. We've also heard about the role of human behavior and how you motivate human behavior. So those of us who, who think about these things and realize that we are not knowledgeable enough in all of these areas, the technology, the environment, the human part of it, we realize how, how all of those things have to fit together to make solutions that work for everybody. Um, and, and I think that the, the ultimate way to get this right is to look at all of those things together, which means, as Megan started with, collaborations. It means all of us working together on this problem. So you said a lot of what uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm thinking as well. But I, I think since we're first and foremost people and we're consumers, um, I find myself every day looking at my own carbon footprint and thinking about what could I do to minimize my carbon footprint. So I've told my boss I'm telecommuting, I'm not driving anymore. No, I haven't told him that yet. <laughs> I know this is live, but I said it anyway. Um, but I think it is important that you look at your behaviors. You think about things that could I reuse it, could I repurpose it, am I buying this with the right purpose, with the right motivation. And um, I, th I think it is a personal choice. What you decide to buy, obviously, is very much that. Um, and so I think it is good for us to kind of take stock of our own behavior. I think coming back to Susanna's point about the solutions, the environmental complexity, the, the complexity of the environmental problem that we're facing today, um, I think I, I would say I, I really want to leave people with the impression that this is a solvable problem. Um, but we do need to think about what are the economies that we're creating? How are those circular economies? How do we get those solutions to scale? Um, and how do we tap into the minds that we haven't yet brought to bear? Because I, again, come back to this whole idea of inclusive thought processes. The Alliance has 400 ideas. Those are not ideas from the same people that we've talked to over the past 40 or 50 years. Those are brand new ideas. So those are the things that we're looking for is, again, the ideas that are ones that we haven't thought because we have a certain mindset. Those are the things that we want to hear about. And I think it's important for this generation of scientists and engineers to be bringing those to bear. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I agree and echo that we really need creative solutions. We need to be working together. Um, the Department of Energy is having 
uh, an event next month to bring experts together to just talk about what does the future look like and what should we be thinking about for the next generation generation of solutions. So the, like was already said, the solution is not necessarily out there uh, right now. We need to be thinking creatively and be thinking about um, all of the implications for our decisions. So, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Let's give everybody a hand. I want to thank all of you for a wonderful discussion. Uh, there were about 50, 55 questions that were there. A lot of them not asked, so uh, just in the interest of time. But our panelists will be available uh, in the next room uh, after, after I get a few thoughts that I want to share with you. Uh, one, uh, we've got two more symposia coming up in uh, February and March. Uh, the first one is on automation of transportation, and the second one is looking at energy infrastructure. So would love to have you all back for that. Hopefully, we'll have better weather. Uh, I say that with tongue in cheek because Every time UH Energy has a, an event, we get bad weather. So, so you can almost <laughs> dial that in. Okay. Uh, but uh, with that said, thank you all for being here. Our panelists will be available. And th thanks again for this wonderful discussion. Thanks.